Good morning, everyone. Thank you uh, very much. I, I mean, I appreciate uh, this notion of a, a relaxed uh, session. This is I'm a bit more relaxed than I was this time last year. Some of you uh, maybe um, are in Glasgow, and so you, you'll appreciate that. And one of the things we were doing in Glasgow was uh, introducing a new uh, exhibition. And so perhaps some of you went to it. Um, it kind of doesn't matter if you didn't. But uh, what I thought I'd like to do is kind of share. We, we used a, a range of strategies to try to interpret uh, the material in this exhibition. And so I'm going to just show you them and kind of show you to talk about some of the issues which we had uh, related to that. And I did this with various colleagues, but most important of the colleagues was Mark Hall, who's uh, sitting over here in the, in the white shirt. And he, at the time, was uh, this was a, a joint project between our university museum in, in Glasgow and uh, and Perth Museum and Art Gallery, and that's where, where Mark was working at the time. So that, that was really fruitful. But as you'll see, we've, we've drawn in uh, a number of other a number of other things. So, I mean, you know, in many ways, a kind of museum space doesn't immediately invite you into kind of appreciating the kinds of issues which were important for us. And what I hope you'll see is that we were really fortunate in being able to work with a range of different uh, experts to, and we followed different uh, strategies, if you like, using different media to bring out different things. And I suppose if there's one thing that's kind of linking it is we, all of it was done by pretty thoughtful people. So there's a kind of intellectual undercurrent which is driving things forward. So we had a lot of goals, um, and I suppose the goals which uh, uh, are most relevant here, I mean, partly we were keen to kind of make sure that you know, this is a proper archaeological project. It wasn't a bunch of, you know, kind of treasure to, to be kind of uh, flashed about. So that was a bit of a challenge to do. We were very keen to kind of try to evoke the landscape kind of give a sense of place even when you are in a room somewhere else, you know, black box kind of situation. But I think most importantly we were very keen to, to make the stuff we were doing accessible, intellectually accessible to, to a wide audience. And it kind of occurred to me tor towards the end that one of the things we were wanting to do is to provide really memorable in images that people would take away and also images which we are going to be able to use as we go to write this project up. So this exhibition and the project itself had a number of, of challenges uh, which have to do with the kind of intrinsic um, nature of the, the project itself. First of all, we're working in an intensively cultivated environment. So you, know, you can't see the sites. You can't see the sites as you're walking around they're plowed, they're doing useful things, they're, this is where most of your whiskey comes from, you know, so, it's, so it is obviously quite a useful uh, place, but it's, and from an archaeological point of view, it's, it's a bit rubbish, because you, know, you can't really, for, for most of the valley bottom, you can't see it, unless you happen to see things from the air, so we have crop mark archaeology, and this is how the site is discovered, and, uh, you know, the, and there's tons of stuff here. So this is part of the problem, is kind of ex explaining the discovery process, the, the kind of uh, analysis, and, and how we got to where we're going. And the other part of the, the kind of story, part of the narrative, uh, relates to a body of sculpture, which, so, so this is a site which has lots of prehistoric time depth, there's about uh, 5,000 years of activity there, and uh, the prehistoric burial grounds, as you'll see in a second, uh, are taken over and recycled and reused as we move into the early Middle Ages, which is why we have our cheeky title, Cradle, Cradle of Scotland. I mean, this, is, this is where these kings uh, decided to set up shop on this ancient burial ground. And one of the kind of most tangible 
artifacts of that is the sculpture which happens to be there. So one of the kind of a uh, you know great contributions to uh, European culture that that the, the people of Northern Britain make is this sculpture. Unfortunately, most of it, you know, that you've seen the good one, but most of it is actually pretty smashed up. You know, it's had a hard life. It's hard to understand. It's difficult for specialists to get their head around it. What are we looking at? What part of the, you know? So that was, you know, we know it's important at one level, but we also know it's pretty hard to understand. So that was a challenge for us. So there's a kind of chronological kind of structure to it. Uh, you know, early prehistory, a kind of Iron Age, Roman Iron Age kind of moment, and then this emergence of this Pictish kingdom, which we, w we won't kind of dwell on, but it kind of provides part of that structure. And I'm, again, I'm not going to dwell on this. I just want, to, just for those of you who are not perhaps, you know, so familiar with Scotland, we're just talking about the East Midlands here. We're just talking about one of the valleys which happens to be fertile and attractive, and it's got a lot of things going for it, and I'm quite happy to talk about the detail of the archaeology uh, later, but I, I re really just want to kind of let you kind of, I want to kind of focus on the, um, the way we presented it, rather than the content, if you like, but it helps to, to know that it's in this, where it is. And I want, so one of the things that we had to, to deal with is we had... <coughs> Lots of, I mean, we've, we did, we've been working there for 10 years. We just finished this year, so we have lots of evidence of it. So we've tried to kind of, I'm not going to tell you 10 years worth in the, uh, but what I'm going to do is, uh, I just, so one of the kind of the best finds, one of the ones that is a, a challenge for us is, is a burial, a kiss burial, Bronze Age kiss burial, which, the, although the body didn't survive, it had really remarkable preservation because it's sealed under this rather large stone. And within this kiss, some weird microclimate created by the bronze allowed organic preservation. So we've got things like the, the horn handle and the sperm whale tooth pommel on this dagger surviving, as well as flowers. So this is the earliest floral tribute uh, to be excavated in Britain. Uh, so that's all quite nice, you know. What do we do with that? How do you present that? So we thought about the kind of performance art. <laughs> but we could, Gordon, you know, couldn't stay there for three months. So because <laughs> there's that Lefroy wouldn't keep him going long enough. So uh, anyway, so we didn't do that. So what we and we because we didn't know what the body was, we didn't even know the sex of it. So we just had a wooden um, kind of alienish looking thing to represent this. And we, we've got the, in cases, we've got the daggers and, and, and other things, but they, although they're, they've survived remarkably, they're not really pretty. And, they, and again, so we had a, a specialist uh, uh, to, to construct uh, replicas which then people can see what it's supposed to look like and how it's going to look like. So this was one strategy to kind of make a model and get, get bowls, you know, there was wooden bowls in there, so to get things kind of reproduced. That was one of the strategies we followed. For In order to get the kind of bigger setting landscape, we worked with a, a, a chap named David Simon. And now David is a painter, and he's kind of obsessive as well. So he works, he makes models of everything. And then he takes photographs of them. And then he starts painting. So he knows everything's in scale. He makes models based on the archaeological stuff. So this is our early Neolithic arrangement. So he's the hills are the right hills. So they're not, you know, they, so he's done a lot of field work to, to try to situate this. He's kind of, this. everything is kind of scaled up from our Field work, and so he's kind of it, it produced this. Now he's at our suggestion. He's these are just great Neolithic timbers, oak trees. There's a lot of artistic license here, which is helping us think about this. So he's he's uh, he's jazzed them up a bit. He's kind of he's suggested maybe they were a bit painted. 
we know there was lots of fires and stuff, but we don't really know what was going on. So we just have this idea of here is a big space which people gathered and closed. And that's possibly the kind of main issue here. But it's a, it's a place which keeps going. And so we wanted to show how it evolves, how, how the monuments here, the timbers have fallen away, and other monument forms are being introduced in the later Neolithic, in the, in the early Bronze Age. And uh, later still, this is this kiss burial that we were looking at earlier is kind of introduced. So we wanted to kind of build, build that up. Now this was really helpful for us, and these will be used in the monograph. And we think it's going to be really useful as a way of kind of drawing the reader in as we're draw, trying to draw the, the visitor to the exhibition in to see these details. And there's a kind of huge amount of decision-making dialogue behind behind this, the, these paintings, and they took a lot of time. And I don't know if many people would have done that. As I say, he's a bit obsessive and really, really keen, and that, that turned for us to be very helpful. One of the uh, kind of strands of the story is that site then goes out of use, for TV, it kind of goes out of use, the big hiatus there, and we have lots of attention on the hills, which are you know, a few kilometers away, kind of overlooking the valley. And there's lots of monuments. And this is just the, all our radiocarbon dates. And these red ones in here are the, from the hill fort. So we've got all this stuff happening for TV, and it stops, and then, as you'll see, picks up again. So for a few centuries in the, in the first millennium BC AD, they just they go somewhere else. And so we were just looking at this. Uh, this is the 14th, this is where the kiss and all that other crop marks are. And on the margins, tons of hill forts. And by now we've kind of excavated at all of them. But just really to get chronology and build up. So we don't so one of the things is we've great at kind of situating them in a landscape, how they how they uh, would have related to that kind of topography and so on. Not so good about the, the, the what's going on at them because these are small excavations. So we have a good chronology, but really I would say that's kind of a, a, a best guess on the basis of the uh, uh, how, how, the, how it might have looked. And we've got a similar occasion where we one of the other sites occupied during the Roman period, uh, it's a very impressive site. We've kind of used kind of technical, um, you know, modern digital survey to, to bring it out. Uh, but the key thing for us, lots of Roman treasure, the key thing for us is it's a, this really dynamic place. It's a place where um, the kind of uh, beginnings of chieftain society seem to be kind of being worked out by these Romans, kind of Roman interaction with the native Iron Age people. So we know there's a certain amount of trade. We know there's this very impressive site. And part of the narrative we have is that it gets burned down. We don't know how it gets burned down. We don't know who it gets burned down. But it does get completely destroyed and deliberately. So we try to imply that these chaps might have had something to do with it without actually putting them on the site. It was a kind of difficult one for us, uh, and maybe one which uh, uh, is certainly some of my colleagues were not that comfortable with. <laughs> but the Romans are really nice. They would never do that. So, anyway, so the final phase deals with the sculpture. When it, the, the Pictish kings go to this great deep history of, uh, you know, prehistory of an uh, uh, ancestral burial ground, and they're Christian, so they're kind of making a kind of Christian landscape over imposed, uh, or imposed upon this earlier uh, deep landscape. And they're using sculpture as the kind of most durable bit. But they're also burying here, and we know this, there's lots of, I don't know, just some of the graves very distinctive. <laughs> dwell on that. But we've got lots of evidence for this kind of inter, in, you know, the reuse and the kind of involvement and kind of uh, messing about, it's probably um, it's not too pejorative a way, because we don't really know what they're doing, but they are digging into these old monuments, they're burning things, they're, they're doing stuff, and as well as burying in the neighborhood. 
And a lot of stuff has to do with fire. You know, there's probably something to do with uh, with, with uh, you know, kind of the, the, the um, you know seasonal uh, fertility rituals, which you know, Celtic ones, which have lots of fire. Um, and so there's a kind of death and reburial thing. So here we've got this typical Pictish burial monument, uh, and we know that there's timber structure around it. We have no idea. We just have the post tools. So here, again with David Simon, we decided to kind of make little mortuary houses which are modeled on early Christian churches as depicted in the Book of Kells, which is contemporary. Uh, so again, we're trying to kind of make people think that these might be really special graves. These are, you know, these are the burial places of kings. So maybe they did something quite jazzy. We don't really know much about how the church was. So the palace site, because we just didn't get into the right areas. So it's in the distance and it's, uh, and it's a bit of smoke as well. That helps to obscure the fact that we don't actually know what's going on. Now, in presenting the monuments, we used two techniques. One is we worked with a guy who's uh, named Ian Scott, and he's a, a great illustrator. He's the leading illustrator. He's been doing this for about 50 years. And he's not only very good at uh, drawing, but he's very good at analyzing what he's seeing and representing it. So there's a huge amount of interpretation embedded in these drawings. Um, and but So what we did was... So we, took our bits of stone and we lit them up and uh, we got, we, his drawings are really meant to be for publications on but we actually blew them up to life size so that people would appreciate that, you know, this bit of stone comes from that bit of cross and they, because otherwise the stones are so bitty and they're just not good enough or they're too big. So the arch, for instance, is in the National Museum in, in Edinburgh and it's stuck to the wall, and they weren't going to let us have it. And the cross, which is outside, uh, is also quite, you know, we couldn't get it. So we've, we've used digital things to represent it. So here, these are crosses. They're meant to be really grand statements of power and artistic patronage. And unless we come up with a way of kind of conveying that, they don't really work. So I'm not going to, um, I have little animations for this, but I, don't, I think in view of the time, I'm not going to go to that. But you'll see what we've done here is a, a, a 3D scan of the, the Great Cross, the Duckland Cross with the inscription and all the kind of iconography of kingship on it. And uh, that animation rotates around and it's allowed us to interpret it. It's also allowed us to paint it so people can see the... Uh, um, you know, kind of things. So there's a great, it's very powerful in that sense. We're, we're able to kind of project it life size so it has a scale of kind of grandeur if, as you, you know, come into the room and see it. But we're also able to kind of have a, a bit of fun painting it and <coughs> using it to kind of pick out some of the motifs and explain what, what you're looking at. And so this is, this is the kind of raw material. I won't. I won't. Um, we I, I know. I'm not going to bother these for these at the moment. But I, so I just uh, to, to conclude. Then we 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 pulled out all the stuff we could do. We got as much digital material as we could use. We used very old-fashioned drawing. We used a kind of really crafty kind of painting, and uh, you know, embedded to to try to bring out the to achieve these things. And so um, I think that. In some respects, we've been successful, and I think that you know we have created memorable images and ones which will stick with people who kind of engage with this this material. So I'm not going to chew up any more time, but um, I'm also not going anywhere. So I'm happy to talk about this at more length. And I had obviously lots of help and money and historic Scotland, especially with the money, and so uh, maybe. Maybe we can kind of put around if people want these animations, I can they can be made accessible. You probably don't want to scribble that down yourself. 
So, thanks very much.